Hello, welcome to my talk about using MIPDSI as main display interface. I'm Marcel Ziswiller, the software team lead embedded Linux BSB at Toradex. I joined Toradex in 2011. I basically spearheaded the embedded Linux adoption there. I introduced an upstream first policy and with that got into top 10 U-boot as well as kernel arm sock contributor at times. And our latest platform is the industrial embedded Linux platform, Torizon. And it's fully based on mainline technology. It's using mainline U-boot with distribute KMS, DRM, graphics with Etnaviv and Nuvo, and it uses ODR update with OS3 and also supports containerized uh, workloads with Docker. What will we cover today? I will introduce a MIPI display serial interface, MIPI DSI. Then I will show you the Display adapter system design that we chosen for Verdin, that is uh, the latest uh, system on module family from Toradex. And I will then also give a quick introduction into the Linux DSI subsystem. Then I'm covering the DRM stack DSI bridge chip integration. We also look at the DSI bridge chip ecosystem. And I will talk a little bit about bridge chips that are supported in mainline Linux. And then the next part is basically about the auto detection. I will show you how we implemented that using uh, display adapters and they have an EEPROM and based on that contents, we can auto detect which display basically a customer is using. I also show you how we integrated that in U-Boot. So U-Boot is reading the EEPROM contents and then selects an applicable device tree overlay, basically. I also talk a little bit about how you can integrate that into a U-Boot fit image. So for a final product, that's a really nice concept to have it all in one image. And you can use port specific and display adapter specific device tree overlays. And I will sum that up with a live demo where I actually can show you a board that I have here, which has this whole DSI auto detection uh, implemented. Okay, let's dive into the MIPI display serial interface topic. It's basically a specification by the Mobile Industry Processor Interface Alliance, the so-called MIPI Alliance. And it's basically about the high speed differential signaling, point to point serial bus. And it's used as an interface between a host processor or a SOC and a display module. Whether that is a discrete uh, kind of display or like in our case, when you go through a bridge chip. It's a high performance, low power and low electromagnetic interference EMI uh, solution. It uh, compared to kind of legacy parallel displays, of course, it has a very reduced pin count. And another goal was to have compatibility across different vendors. And usually you have like one high speed differential clock line and then one or more data lanes that actually carry the, the actual pixel, pixel, pixel data, sorry. Then for transferring that, the, the, it's one differentiates between a low power and a high speed mode. While the high speed mode is usually unidirectional, basically just, you know, fanning out the display data, the low power mode usually also allows uh, some bidirectional communication between the display and the host processor. 
From a specification point of view, the initial version came out in May 2006. The current version is uh, version 131 uh, that got released in December 2015. There is also a successor specification I just quickly want to mention, which whose initial version was in January 2016. There is now the version 1.1 out, published May 2018. And that one has support for both DeFi as well as the newer CeFi. And it supports ultra high definition. So not only 4K, but also 8K. So it's kind of uh, for future applications. Okay. Then how does that look from the layers? So in the physical layer, it uses MIPI DeFi. There are various versions which basically increase the, the speed of the lanes. So it started with a one gigabit per second lane and can nowadays with DeFi 2.0 go up to four and a half gigabit per second lanes. And then on the higher layer, you have the MIPI display command set, so-called MIPI DCS, and that also incorporates display stream compression, DSC, that is basically a standard that the Video Electronic Standard Association, the VESA guys, uh, have done. And nowadays on higher end SOCs, it's a de facto standard. And unfortunately, as it comes mainly from like uh, the mobile uh, industry, it's quite hard to get long-term available discrete MIPI DSI display panels. So for a long time, years ago, there were hardly even any panels available. That changed a little bit with, with a lot of um, kind of maker boards pushing to that. So nowadays you can, for example, for the Raspberry Pi, you can get a, such a display. But keep in mind that a lot of these displays are actually at the end just basically a, a DSI bridge chip again, and then use a regular parallel or LVDS display on the on the actual display panel side. On such bridge chips, they can convert from pretty much or to pretty much any kind of display interface like RGB, LVDS embedded or regular display port or HDMI. Now I want to show you our display adapter system design. So this basically shows a kind of a one part of, of a, a system on module design. So you see there the DSI mezzanine connector. That's basically the connector that will go to such a display adapter. And that uh, is a, basically it's a generic system concept. And the idea is that uh, those DSI display adapter boards, they can integrate various bridge chips. So the, it also has an EEPROM on it uh, to store identification or parametrization data. And then this kind of board to board mezzanine connector on there, we have a MIPI DSI, of course, with one clock lane and up to four data lanes. Then we have a bunch of GPIOs, for example, to enable backlight, or if, you, if there is also a touch control integrated for the touch interrupt. We also have two independent I2C buses. The idea behind that is, depending on what actual display you might connect, it, it might use that for like DDC edit and if you now have a bridge chip, you basically could even have kind of bridge chips kind of in a chained configuration because you don't know what, what your actual display might do if this is a display port or a HDMI display. So we try to have an independent I2C bus for that. Then also further signals might be PWM for, for like backlight uh, brightness stuff. We also have an optional I2S for integrated audio, which is can be found basically in HDMI or in, in a display port. And we also use a generic kind of system control signals that we have available on our module standard, which is basically power enable uh, Mocky. That is kind of our uh, abbreviation for module out carrier in or sleep Mocky or reset Mocky. So those are kind of generic system uh, 
uh, signals that are also available. This is basically one uh, of those uh, modules in that family. It's We call it the Virgin IMX 8M Mini. It has basically an NXPI.MX8M Mini Sysmon chip. It's uh, this one has a single display controller. It's basically of the LCD kind of family. If you're familiar with the Linux stack there, then uh, as a display output, it, it really only supports MIPDSI output with up to four data lines. And as kind of the DSI uh, controller IP, uh, NXP uses the so-called Northwest logic IP. Uh, from a DeFi point of view, it supports version 1.2, but only a, a maximum data transfer of 1.5 gigabit per second, while in theory DeFi 1.2 would also allow for higher ones. Then from a resolution point of view, you can do like full HD, uh, 60 hertz, or even a, a kind of a wide format is 1800 by 1200. Uh, okay, then now let's gonna look at some of these display adapters. Also the ones I can show you at the demo at the end. This is for example, the word in DSI to HDMI adapter. It integrates a uh, Lonsium semiconductor LT8912B, MIPI DSI to HDMI bridge. And uh, this one is HMI version 1.4 capable, can do uh, full HD at uh, up to 60 Hertz in, in a 8-bit RGB uh, kind of fashion. It also has another chip on it, the so-called SDHMI 2C1. Uh, that is a kind of a single chip ESD protection and signaling conditioning chip. So basically that's that little chip just next to the connector that, that will basically, uh, you know, do all this kind of fancy stuff with the signaling that you uh, can easily meet the standard HDMI type A kind of specification. And then of course, also the, the EEPROM that we talked about so that we can actually uh, identify it. And of course there is a lot of power stuff involved uh, and some kind of interrupts. For example, that chip has an interrupt that basically it can interrupt you uh, when it gets a new screen or something like that, that you could kind of uh, renegotiate things like that, hot plug, things like that. Another adapter that is uh, more common in the uh, embedded world is, is the Verdin DSi to LVDS adapter. That one uses a Texas instrument, SN65 DSi84. It's basically a MIPI DSi to dual link LVDS bridge. So it supports configurable single or dual line LVDS up to like uh, kind of this wide full HD uh, resolution or in a single channel, this, this kind of, uh, you know, extended uh, HD in 60 frames also and up to 24 bit per pixel. Uh, this one also uh, integrates a touch, capacitive touch controller. Basically, uh, it allows to directly connect. It also used from a connector point of view, that, that kind of connector that uh, we also sell, uh, sell this Toradex capacitive touch display, the 10, 10 inch one. Okay. Then let's have a look on the Linux side. How does that look? Basically uh, this DSI subsystem, uh, Basically, it has one piece, the, the DRM MIPI DSI core that basically common logic and some helpers to deal with the MIPI DSI peripherals. And then basically you have a display engine driver. And uh, I also show there the, the actual calls. So they basically register into the DRM core and then uh, basically I have the DSI part, the DRM MIPI DSI core, and there, uh, in our case, 
the actual DSI host controller is this Northwest logic one. So the NVL DSI and that one uh, registers host register. And then we can have one or multiple bridges kind of, you know, in a chained configuration that goes through the DRM bridge core. And there, for example, in the uh, DSI to LVDS bridge, this TA uh, SN65 would then basically add uh, called a theorem bridge add, so it gets added there. And then on a panel side, you basically, for LVDS, there is, for example, the, the, the generic uh, kind of simple LVDS panel thing, the panel LVDS, and that one would is added with kind of a panel add. That's kind of how it works on the interface side how does the actual kind of data now get out to the display so you usually have a display engine driver so that might be the lcd if and of course the, the whole kind of rendering you might have a gpu support for that for example on the idol mixes uh, with etna if and then uh, that kind of renders into planes and through the crtc it then gets fanned out through a DSI encoder in our case. So that will be this uh, kind of MIPI DSI uh, Northwest logic thing. And then there is a concept of DSI connector and that's how it flows to data then. How does a DSI bridge chip now integrate into that? So from a uh, DRM point of view, it's basically a DRM bridge, and uh, this are these DRM bridge functions. So there is an attach, enable, disable, and uh, DRM bridge add. So that is into the DRM bridge uh, side of things, and then of course you have the DRM connector side, and. Uh, there are the DRM connector funks. So fill modes, detection, destroy, and then there are also some helper functions basically to manage get modes, mode valid. So those are used to negotiate the mode and make sure that, that it's you know driven by a valid mode. Then there is the connector init, helper add, attach, encoder. So that's where the the MIPDSI encoder kind of gets hooked in. And then, of course, it calls the DRM panel attach, which, which then will basically call into the next uh, one, which is then whatever panel is also uh, kind of attached there. From a I2C device point of view, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's of course, it's an I2C device on a bus. And it's basically detected using regular ID table and, and or uh, off match table. And of course, a common uh, kind of uh, design uh, element there is to, to use a reg map. So basically to abstract the, the register of such a bridge chip, one can use regular I2C reg map. So with the DevM reg map in it I2C, and I2C set client data to actually uh, kind of publish, uh, yeah, publish that. Then. And on the MIPDSI device side, there is this MIPDSI device register full, which registers it. And then once it's ready, you can attach it with MIPDSI attach. Let's also talk about some kind of bridge chip integration pitfalls that we have met along the way. Basically one problem kind of <laughs> as usual is that a lot of those data sheets seem to be super secret. So uh, it's kind of tricky, especially with, with some of these kind of Chinese vendors, they, uh, yeah, they don't seem to want to give those out easily. And then of course, the vendors themselves, they usually only have some kind of engine downstream driver if you're lucky or, or even just some kind of bare skeleton driver only where you can kind of guess at the <laughs> register set and also uh, kind of in what 
combination and, and, and order stuff needs to be done. Uh, and then e even if you have some kind of code, they, of course, it's all very hard coded. So it's not, not very user friendly in a sense that if you're trying to support a generic kind of system on module concept like we are trying to do, which we basically would want that our customers could more or less hook up uh, any display then to that display adapter, so it makes it rather hard. So for example, the current LVDS uh, adapter implementation that is kind of uh, hard coded for uh, for single channel because there is a version of, the, the, of that chip that only supports single channel and that kind of was the only driver that was halfway kind of available. So we are uh, still uh, looking into actually, uh, you know, working more on that. Then one problem we saw is that the whole link up sequence stuff is not well documented. So if you have some kind of a skeleton driver, you're not sure, you know, in what order and by what things that will be called. And that may require a lot of trial and error, uh, especially with like the other problem we also saw that of course, usually in embedded devices, the stuff is rather limited you have some limited kind of uh, you know dividers uh, frequencies available uh, either on the controller or on the bridge side or even on both and you kind of sometimes have to you know do some trickery to actually find some uh, you know combination that halfway works so in our case we had to kind of get a little bit outside of the spec of our actual display and then it suddenly worked fine because all the other frequencies there, we just had problems that this Northwest logic thing in the NXP chip just didn't want to drive the, the, the TI chip basically somehow. So you might have to do some tuning on this, on this frequency stuff. Okay. Then how about the bridge chips? that we currently use. So I can talk a little bit about more stories in that area. So on the DSI side, we use this Lontium Semiconductor. That's some kind of a Chinese vendor, uh, basically rather nice chip. It's just not really well documented or anything. Luckily, we found some uh, downstream driver from the Rockchip Linux guys on GitHub. So we, we actually adopted that one. But of course, unfortunately, with such downstream stuff, you know how it is. So it was some ancient kind of version of the DRM API. So we have to kind of forward port it to later one. Uh, we also had to fix some kind of confusing naming of some structure and instant stuff. Then we had to revert the whole kind of driver to be a proper I square C device because before it was just kind of a hacked thing. And then also we had to, you know, have a look at the full register set from some pseudo code that, that got actually provided by Lontium upon uh, kind of packing them over months, we got some pseudocode from them. So we were able to, uh, you know, integrate uh, more of the register set. Then we also improved the whole rec map integration there. And, uh, you know, another thing uh, that is kind of a feature is that those bridge chips often have more than one I2C address. So it's basically can be handled in Linux with the so-called I2C sub addresses. So we also properly reserve uh, those now. And then another thing, we added regular I2C based uh, DCC, DDC edit handling. So basically when you with a HMI adapter, when you there have a, an actual monitor connected, you might want to actually find out from the monitor what modes you can do and we integrated regular handling there. Then also the hot plug detection was, was missing. So it wasn't, you know, supported that you would during runtime kind of connect and uh, different display. So we added support for that. And then 
of course, we saw some problems when we did that, uh, because in our case, uh, the, the GPIO is actually not kind of a SOC native GPIO, but goes through a GPIO expander because we, we kind of were, you know, <laughs> short on GPIOs. And we found out that then, of course, uh, because it goes through an I2C bus to, to actually get to that expander, uh, that crashed because we used the wrong kind of, uh, you know, variant of the GPIO uh, get value stuff. So you need to be careful there. And another thing that was also done wrong on the DSI side was that the bus, bus format was not properly set. Still not very pretty, but hey, <laughs> it works. And further cleanup and upstreaming there is pending. How about uh, the other one? That was the HMI one, the LVDS one, uh, Texas Instruments. Uh, uh, basically, we started off with a downstream driver taken from the Compulab Yocto Meta layer on GitHub. Uh, luckily, they had adopted it already for kind of an idodemic SADA mini design. Unfortunately, it hard coded for a single channel LVAS use case, which luckily our regular panel is actually a single channel. But of course, we would also want to support uh, the customers to, to basically uh, attach any kind of a panel also to our channel full HD ones. So that is pending and also further cleanup and upstreaming is pending. How about this DSI bridge chip ecosystem? So if you're getting into this kind of uh, area, uh, it's of course kind of, you face a lot of design, system design questions if you want to integrate something like that. And unfortunately, uh, we met that a lot of those vendors, they're still very reluctant to kind of mainlining their drivers. So neither uh, Lontium nor kind of Texas Instruments has, has really put any work in. So it's basically us from the community that, that have to step in there. And that's also kind of the reason there are only very few mainline supported bridge chips. I will actually uh, kind of talk about those uh, on a later slide. And therefore also there are only very few uh, kind of uh, examples where we can copy stuff from uh, and find kind of, you know, solutions to, to some things that you might face. And of course, if you do actual hardware and want to sell that, like we at Toradex do, uh, it's also quite tricky to actually procure some of this actual silicon that, that there, there might be mainline driver, but you might not really, you know, be able to actually buy such uh, silicon chips. And then another thing we saw is of course, kind of the conformance. Of course, MIPDSI, when the specification uh, got developed, it, it, it was the goal to actually be kind of vendor independent. But you know how that goes with other stuff like <laughs> USB or so. Uh, if, if some of those guys are not really adhering to the spec, then it can get tricky. And so this conformance with various kind of bridge chip silicons is, is uh, yeah, can be problematic. How about the uh, kind of the chips supported in mainline? You can find those on the driver's GPU DRM bridge. And uh, I kind of uh, uh, filtered out the ones for DSI, of course, because that was the only thing we were interested here. So, one thing to note is that you have to differentiate between kind of SOC internal IP that you might also find there. So uh, certain SOC chips basically might already have a bridge integrated. Uh, for example, I believe the regular uh, 8M has a kind of a, you know, uh, already in the chip does from DSI some, some other kind of interfaces as far as I'm remember. So you might also find drivers for that. And then of course, also this 
create external bridge chips that are and of course you find also directly connected panels so one thing for example you find there is a northwest logic uh, that was recently added for the imix 8 series that is basically one of these SOC internal ips then on the uh, discrete bridge chip side uh, there are some analog devices uh, parts supported the 33 and the 35 which are basically uh, VPDSI receivers with HDMI transmitters so basically similar to the Lonsium one that that we are using then another one is uh, from Parade the, this is a VPDSI to EDP converter that uh, we also used some customers use that in some designs uh, then from Texas Instruments, there is actually a mainline driver, but not for the LVDS one that we are using, which has, is the 85, but the 86 is basically a DSI to EDP bridge. And looking closer at this driver, the driver is actually written kind of in an agnostic way. So the idea would be that, that you know, we could uh, uh, really extend this driver to because kind of the back-end DSI side would be the same, but of course the front-end in this case is EDP, and in our case it would then be the LVDS. Another one that is quite common used is the Toshiba uh, ones. They have both uh, version uh, 64 at the end for, for LVDS, and there is a version 68 or 78 that is basically uh for uh other display interface then on the discrete panel side like I already mentioned there is basically the one of the readily available ones is the seven inch raspberry pi touch panel and that one actually inside it uses uh, uh, one of these toshiba ones actually a 62 at the end which you won't find the discrete kind of uh, theorem bridge driver but in the raspberry pi kind of panel driver it's kind of hacked in there and this is a dsi to parallel rgb bridge basically so uh, yeah i guess they they just had the goal to kind of mainline that panel but i think it would have been kind of smarter to do that in a more generic fashion to also have a regular kind of bridge driver and then just use a regular uh, panel simple thing on top okay now let's dive into the auto detection uh, topic so uh, basically a straightforward idea was to well why not just store the device tree in in the eprom uh, now why not just uh, you know using some kind of FTD features in Yugo to just, uh, you know, change some disabled versus OK thing in the device tree. But unfortunately, if you look closer at uh, device trees in this area, you have this kind of uh, graph, device graph linking stuff with the endpoint and the remote endpoint. So it's not so easy to kind of just, you know, set something to OK and, and have that work. So the second straightforward idea was to just, you know, store the overlay in the EEPROM. Unfortunately, at least the EEPROM that we have chosen because they were, you know, the EEPROMs, they also cost something. So in the 2K size, uh, it's kind of hard. Well, you could maybe compress it or something, but it's still very small. So as a compromise, we, we now just store a, a kind of a, identification so-called configuration block and then just use that to actually apply a device tree overlay so how is Yubu doing that we already have this kind of config block uh, handling code for NAND and EMMC integrated we generalize that to EEPROMs and then uh, we have basically a table of these product IDs that will then map to overlay file names. And of course, with HDMI uh, one 
can also do hot block detect of the actual screen and it will do DDC edit. Uh, or one can do custom display specific parametrization. And so it's also possible to act actually cascade device tree overlay. So one can have basically the auto detected display adapter uh, device tree overlay. And then on top of that, uh, then an actual kind of uh, hard coded overlay that, that has the panel uh, or monitor specification in it. In the LVDS case, that's, that's usually anyway the way it is done. So it usually requires further parametrization for the actual panel that is connected to it, whether it's single dual channel, it's color format, uh, and of course the whole kind of timing resolution stuff. So if you look at those overlays, that's basically you have these fragments. Uh, on the left side, you see the HDMI one. On the right side, the, the LVDS one. Uh, I don't want to go in, in too much detail, but basically you can, you know, you have like a fragment for the I2C bus, uh, which you set the speed and OK. So this is actually the kind of the DDC one, the top one. And then you have the fragment for the actual I2C bus where, where you have the bridge chip on. Uh, you see that one at the address 48. And you hook up the other bus to do its DDC bus. Uh, you have like op block detect and all this kind of stuff. And then, of course, you see this, uh, you know, device graph linking stuff with the ports, endpoints, remote endpoints. And the last fragment is actually exactly that. That's from the DSI controller side. It's port that links back to the, to the, the actual bridge. And in the LVDS case, it's a little bit more complicated because we also have uh, you know, stuff like the PWM backlight. Uh, we also have uh, the touch controllers, things like that. So there are actually some more fragments there. Okay. Now, how can we combine that in a fit image? Uh, basically, you can store in a fit image. That's the whole point. You can store various images. So you can have, for example, uh, you know, uh, different uh, uh, device trees for the board. We actually, for example, have a, there is a Wi-Fi and a non-Wi-Fi variant of, of that module available. So you can have those kind of base device trees. And then you can have device tree overlays, the so-called TTBOs, uh, like uh, the one for the LT8912, so the HDMI one, or the one for the, you know, for the LVDS Texas Instrument one. And then you can further combine that into configurations and there it actually allows uh, uh, kind of there are two uh, ways allowed you can have kind of fixed configurations in this case here i show like a configuration zero and configuration one and then you could of course also integrate overlays there but that would you know the more overlays you have to, that would give you much more configuration and that's why it also is supported that you can basically load a base configuration and then some further overlays and you do that with the boot them command basically you can have like the load address where you have that fit image stuff and then you can say like uh, you know pound config add and then that configuration, and then you can just continue with like the pound and, and then uh, such uh, device tree overlays. So you can have like a basically a configuration which just has the this, this separate device tree overlay like that applied. Okay. Then of course, also some pitfalls that if you play with device tree overlays that, that you might uh, face. One thing is, of course, uh, some simple overlays, they work just fine. And then you find out you suddenly get this kind of error. At least it says nicely that uh, you don't have the symbols in there. So you need to actually uh, compile those with, with symbols inside. So if you have comp more complex device tree overlays, then you, usually it's not possible to apply them without those symbols. Then another thing that 
I met is that if you're referencing nodes via hex addresses in, in the device tree overlays, it, that stuff is actually case sensitive. So kind of the base device tree, it, it you know, if you want to reference back to a node from the base device tree, you have to make sure that, that this has the same case. Usually, uh, I guess everybody uses lowercase letters in hex numbers, but uh, at least in some kind of downstream NXP stuff, that was not the case. And, uh, you know, I searched forever why it cannot, why it doesn't work. But then I found out it really is a casing of those hex numbers. Uh, another thing that is quite useful when troubleshooting what is actually going on and what actually gets applied is if you actually boot into Linux, you can use, you know, the device tree com compiler on the target port itself. So for example, here, I just oh, package installed it into my image. And then you can actually use the, you know, the input format FS, which understands the, this proc device tree kind of, uh, you know, notation and can actually dump it back into kind of a read readable format in, in basically device tree source format. Then you can actually easily see what really got applied if you have multiple overlays and then, you know, at the end you can't figure out what happened with all that stuff. That's very useful. Okay, I guess then we're ready to get to the demo. For as a first part in the demo, uh, I will just show the console of that board. Basically, you see here on the left, that is basically our Dahlia carrier board with the HDMI display adapter and that kind of module on it. So I will prepare this combination here on my table. Uh, I will show the, the actual board at the end, but for now I will quickly uh, share my screen and I have here the console ready somehow. Let's see, that will be this one. And I turn the board on so it boots up, and you can see basically, of course, it all goes a little bit fast. So let me see. Okay. Yeah. That was the HDMI one. Let's see. Can I can also plug in LVDS one. Power it back on. And it will boot into the uh, into the other variant. The thing that we're showing here is the Toradex Ease installer, and uh, I can now let me check. I can actually show you. The, take the camera. Uh, so that would be that board. Uh, here you see the LVDS adapter connected to this kind of, uh, you know, 10 inch panel. I can boot it up again. So it basically auto detects that display adapter and then initializes the, the 10 inch uh, display. And it then basically loads this easy installer configuration thing. Then I can turn it off. I can put in the HDMI one and I can turn that one on and it detects that one and basically boots that one up. Voila and shows that on the HDMI screen here. Okay. That's basically it. Put that back. And then 
we can do the question and answer session. Still have like five minutes for that. Uh, let me quickly look at that. Uh, whether the low power signal is single ended, I believe it is both both is a differential as far as I know, and it's just using only one line. Okay. That, let me see. That would be that one. Uh, uh, oh, more questions. Whether an end panel like LVDS supports partial update, and how will the you know the bridge propagate that? I guess that will basically be a matter of the actual bridge chip that you use. I guess if uh, if that one if the bridge chip supports such partial update, I guess it would work. It it would basically. Uh, uh, I guess usually that is called kind of smart displays. So you would probably need some uh, kind of frame buffer also on the bridge chip side. So I'm not sure. I've not seen any such chips, but I haven't really looked for it. So I would assume that should be possible, but a rather special use case, I guess. Okay. So that is this one. Let me see what else we have. Ah, oh, yeah, whether we, we consider doing it in the Linux kernel. Uh, of course, we kind of, you know, I attended a lot of those overlay uh, talks in the past, and uh, I remember that some of those uh, actually got rather... Uh, almost a little bit violent, isn't it? <laughs> we didn't really want to get into that too much. I think for a end product in our case, for our customers, it's usually, uh, you know, it it's doesn't need to be ultra kind of uh, runtime-ish that you would connect that during runtime even or something like that. So I think they're fine when, when we load that from a U-boot side. Whether the bridge chip can limit any of the DCS commands that um, I'm not really familiar with that. Uh, why DRM is required with DSI? Well, I guess DRM is kind of the, you know, the, the, the graphic stack in Linux nowadays. So uh, I'm not sure how else you would want to hook up a DSI panel. Uh, I think it makes total sense to, to have that properly integrated in the DRM subsystem. So yeah, we use the overlay stuff in, in U-Boot. Yeah. Why the vendors are reluctant with mainlining or even giving out documents? That That's a very good question. Uh, well, I think they just don't see the value too much. I think a lot of those vendors, they are very project driven. So they, they just kind of sell those chips into projects and, and they, they kind of think, well, it anyway needs some engineering company to integrate that and fine tune it and whatever not. And they, they I think they just don't believe into kind of a generic Linux approach too much yet, but I guess that is, Changing, isn't it? It's evolving. I mean, a uh, couple of years ago, who would have thought that that you could run, uh, you know, open source uh, graphics acceleration on, on our embedded ports like we now have with, with many different drivers, okay? So I, I, I believe we just have to push them further and, and keep reminding them and also, of course, try to mainline more such drivers and then show them that that's a good idea because they will then sell more chips and things like that. Variable refresh rate, that I'm also not so sure. I think that's also something that, that would 
is kind of from the smart display mobile space. I believe DSI definitely supports that, but uh, whether you could also do that with, with a bridge chip, I guess that depends on that bridge chip. Okay. I guess, uh, the, don't know when it will be really finished here. If you have further questions, you can, uh, there is also a Slack channel. So you can bring those to the, to that Slack channel, the, the embedded Linux conference one. I will also hang out there some more and I'm happy to answer some more questions. Uh, you also find my uh, email address, I believe. I have some references here. And yes, I will, I will uh, publish the, the PDF slides. I will just up the, uh, upload them, okay? Thank you very much for your time and have a very nice rest of the conference, this virtual experience. So I'm already uh, past midnight in, in Europe here. Uh, have a nice time. See you guys. Thank you.